Welcome to the latest edition of the Mersey Waves podcast. I'm Michael Doran from Liverpool City Council's communications team. Today I'm talking to the award-winning screenwriter Jimmy McGovern and Tom Sherry, Head of Drama, North and Scotland at BBC Studios in Salford. Uh, we're talking the day after the first episode of Jimmy's latest BBC TV drama, Time, was screened on BBC One. Uh, this three-part show focuses on the lives of two men. One, a teacher, played by Sean Bean, who's been imprisoned after killing a man on a bike whilst drink driving. The other is a firm but fair prison guard, played by Stephen Graham, whose career and life is compromised when prisoners discover his son has been put in another prison and use him and his safety as leverage. Gentlemen, welcome. Hey. I suppose time and... It's, most of the media have described it as a crime drama, which is you know, pretty mm. basic, and you've covered the, the, the prison service, the penal system, reform, rehabilitation, atonement, justice, all of these themes. Jimmy, you, you've been here before and you keep coming back to these central sort of themes. Do you yeah. know why is that? I think it, I was brought up a Catholic, you know, uh, went to a Jesuit school. So uh, all that stuff about atonement, you know, uh, it's, it's in me, you know, it's, it's uh, absolutely part of me, you know, but um, um, I'm fascinated by prison because I could have been there myself, you know, uh, I was very, very lucky, you know, but I was skint as a young man. And when you're skint as a young man, you do things, you know, you, you, you aren't uh, exactly proud of, you know, and um, from about the 80s onwards, I've, I've often been in prison, you know, but um, only to do writers' workshops and things, you know. And um, I've always found that fascinating as well, you know. Um, I just, every time I see a prisoner, apart from those who are extremely violent and things like that, but every time I see an ordinary prisoner, I think, there but for the grace of God go I, you know. And this, this, do you feel like there's, Fair to call them, there's the morality of it all. There's, there's a lot of sliding doors, not just in time as well, anyone who's watched yeah. a lot of your body, your work, there's a lot of sliding door moments of, yeah. you could go down that road, yeah. or you could go down that road, and the cause yeah. and consequence. There's, yeah. a lot, there's the morality that the back plays to all of that as well. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's always down to the fact that um, it's, it's always interesting when a person has to make a choice, isn't it? You know, and... Uh, we all know what to do, uh, and we all know what the right thing to do is, but often it's far too expensive, you know. Uh, I always say, I've, I've, I, even as a young man, I had integrity, as much integrity as everybody else, but I didn't have the money that everybody else had, you know. And it's nice to be able to afford integrity, and I can afford integrity now, you know, uh, so, yeah. And the choices that we make, you feel that that's, not just an issue of your, your upbringing, but your surroundings then as well. It's a, oh, yeah. It's, your environment it's, is... It, a lot of people in the, the prison system, by and large, are from a similar environment and background. Yes, yes, they are. Yeah, an awful lot of working-class people in prisons. You know, there aren't many rich people at all. I wonder why that is. Yeah. You know, it's because, it's because if you're skint, you can't afford to do the right things. You can't afford it. And the... The, the point at which the fact that this is called time, and I'll come on to what we spoke earlier, Tom, and timing, I, I was almost going to start with this question of, as the opening for 10, why now? If you've had this idea, yeah. I think I saw something that you'd had this idea kicking in your head, and you just said it since the 1980s. Yeah. Why not 10 or 20 years ago? What, what, what's, do you, as there was a specific reason why everything came to the right moment for the time to be now? I don't know. I think you've got, uh, if you're a writer and uh, uh, if you're a person who makes his living through stories, you, you've got stories backed up within you, you know, things you find interesting. Uh, and I think it just came about, you know. Uh, obviously, uh, I'm a writer. I'm looking for stories. I'm interested in prisons. You know, I also do a story about prison. But I'd done one about Australia. 
you know, and uh, that was an open prison in a way because you can't escape from Australia, you know, in the uh, 18th century. And uh, um, even in that one, I had, a, I had a man stealing another man's food. And um, I just don't think we did it right in that. But I think we did it right in this, you know. Yeah. What do you do when somebody much tougher than you is stealing your food? Yeah. yeah. The bullying and the... Yeah. And you can't grasp, you know. The one thing you learn in prison is you do not inform on anybody. Yeah. You just don't, you know. So, yeah, I think that the, the bullying was quite... You could feel the tension with them. Yeah. I felt, as somebody watching yeah. it, I, and you immediately yeah. locked into the, the that turmoil that yeah. uh, Sean Bean goes through as somebody who's in an alien environment. Yeah. It hasn't come from the everyday environment yeah. that most prisoners come from. Yeah, yeah, but he's obviously a working class man. And therefore, you know, he's going to understand. Yeah, he's, he's going, going to understand this thing about grassing and not grassing. And yeah, he's, you know, so yeah. And the the underlying the sort of two underlying core issues throughout the the program, as much as it's about the penal system and crime and punishments, is the prisoners themselves. Is this thing of mental health and yeah. education? Yeah. You know, uh, and more, more to the point, the lack of, obviously, yeah. within the prison system. Uh, what, yeah. This is, you already touched on it, but this hasn't changed, has it? This is, you've no. seen, you've se you've just said there you've had this in the back of your mind for a long time. Yeah. How much, that must really frustrate you that you've seen this. And yeah. Nothing's really, you've probably seen third, fourth generation of prisoners now. That yeah. I think it's actually worse. It, it's actually worse than it was. Uh, ever since the cri uh, financial crisis, was it 2008? Um, ever since that financial crisis, there's been cuts in prisons, you know, and an awful, well, even before that there were cuts in prisons, uh, uh, but an awful lot of experienced staff were lost, and they took on new people who didn't have the experience of the experienced staff, and it's cost them, you know, it, it has. Um, now, at the time of COVID, you know, uh, but even before COVID, and, and after COVID, I'm sure, uh, there are pe people banged up in British prisons for 23 hours a day, that is a disgrace. It really is, you know. And you think everyone will say, oh, it's COVID. It's not COVID. It was going on well before COVID, you know. Uh, they go in there. They, you, can see, you can see the issues. Mental health is one. Somebody once said, well, something like 85% of people who are in prisons should not be in prison, a mental health hospital. That's where they should be, you know. There's uh, all, the, all those issues, and that they, that they just aren't addressed. And uh, they aren't going to be addressed because you can see the way this government's going. You know, tough on crime government again, you know, longer sentences, you know. The, the, uh, the, the actual length of sentences is astronomically high now compared to what it was 15 years ago, yeah. 20 years ago especially. Well, the prison, you know, prison phenomenal. population has doubled in the last year. Yes, and, and it, it, in, it, I, th I think they reckon in five or six years' time it'll be over 100,000, you know. That's just in incredible, you know. Yeah. But we know what the mistakes are, but governments get elected because they promise to be tough on the crime, you know, except Blair said tough on crime, tough on the causes of crime, you know. I didn't see him being particularly tough on the causes of crime, but he was, he was certainly so tough on crime. You know? The fact that this was shown on BBC One last night, you know, millions of people will have viewed, you would maybe think that if in this is the scenario that the, the minister responsible or even the prime minister or the chancellor was watching yeah. what what would you if you had a chance what would you want for them to take away from the, the program because there is a political there is an under yeah. as much as that you're talking on the human side yes. of the drama yes what the political what what would you hope them for that to take away as our leaders of our country i think the fact that it's called time uh, and the only thing that works for sean bean's character is the time he spends away from everybody. Prison doesn't work. Prison nearly crucifies him. You see what he goes through in prison. You know, and lots of men go through that in prisons. You know. Even a few women, I'm saying that, because like, it's predominantly male, it? it's a male environment. You know. uh, so time, time can help, you know. Time can help, but prison, prison is no help whatsoever. Do you know? have faith that there was, if government was watching, do you have faith that they'd be listening? Do you think they'd take notice? No, because every time somebody good comes along, I, in good I include Michael Gove, you know, but I also it, it include uh, Rory Stewart. Uh, 
they were good people, you know. Uh, but they were moved on in no time at all. How many have we had in the last, in the last five years we've had? So, so in charge of prisons in this country in the last five years, we must have had about ten people. You know, and they just get moved on. It's, it's absolutely ludicrous, you know. Yeah. No I mean, there's a whole... I mean, we could talk forever about yeah. the, the justice system. I mean, I can't... And to be honest, I can't really let the opportunity slide by with the fact that, although it's not about time, you wrote Hillsborough. Oh, yeah. We just had the collapse of the, the trial. Yes. I mean, you wrote... Well, many people point out that your drama that you wrote on the, uh, on the yeah. tragedy was kick-started the, the, you know, the surge back towards the pendulum of the, the search for truth. Mm. There's no justice to that. No. Now that you're getting to a point in your life where you can look yeah. back and see the arc of stories, not just yeah. within the stories you write, but in life. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Are you, the anger, the fuel, is it, would you like to say that anger fuels you, frustration fuels you? What fuels Yeah, it's a bit of anger, because uh, that, that helps, that gives you the energy to actually write the bloody thing, you know. Because that takes energy and commitment, you well, know. Well, you must, you've written well, a lot, so you must have a lot. Yeah, yeah, well... Uh, in the case of Hillsborough, uh, it was interesting because I got very, very tired. And it was mainly because of lawyers. It was going to the script was going to lawyers and coming back. And it wasn't going to lawyers to make the script better. It was going to lawyers to make the script legal, you know. And it kept coming back. And, and I, I was abs abs absolutely shattered. And somebody came down and gave me a picture of a child who died. You know, uh, it was the father of the child. And I put that down. I got more. And I put them all around me. And I never got tired again. I had, I had those pictures of, you know. So, um, um, so you had a motivation? I, oh, yeah, yeah. That, it's, it's, it's that that drives you. But the big, you know the big thing about this country? People confuse law and justice, you know. And they are often incompatible. If you're talking about Hillsborough, uh, there's, there's been loads of law, absolutely loads of law. There's been no justice, you know, absolutely no justice whatsoever. You know, and you think law gets you justice. It doesn't. When you get embroiled in a thing like Hillsborough, you realise that law and justice are incompatible. The law is designed to keep you away from justice because you are poor. The vast majority of people involved in the Hillsborough football disaster were poor. You know? uh, and uh, the, the judicial system is not designed for poor people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the things I'll touch on in a minute, actually, which we'll come to, because we've just had the BAFTAs, which aired before your uh, show went out, and the whole issue of diversity, and we'll come on to that, because I want to talk about the diversity issue on television, um, in drama, and in TV in general. But uh, if we go back to time then, just for... You wrote the script, I think you're right in saying that you wrote the script with Sean and Stephen in mind, because you've worked with yeah. both in the past. Yeah. Uh, and either one potentially could have played the, either role. Yes. So yeah. what was it about what was it about those actors that made you think that for Sean, for Mark, and Stephen, for Eric, what, what they are vulnerable. They are at the best when they're vulnerable. The the two of them have played hard men. You know, uh, right throughout their careers, they they played hard men. But when they're vulnerable on screen, they are at their very best. You know. And uh, in those three episodes, you see them, uh, you know, really vulnerable at times. Have you, have you seen that? You've seen that from when you worked with them in the past. Then have you, have you seen yeah. a glint of something and thought, ah, there's something to mine there? And... Um, I'd seen their talent. I'd seen that, and yes, I must have seen that because I, I cannot remember a time when I was not aware that these two guys are brilliant and they're vulnerable, and yet I hadn't seen a great deal of that. Oh well, yeah, probably more. Probably more just with, no, 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 I can't say that. I, I, don't, I don't know what it was. I, I, the, they are br brilliant actors, you know. Everybody knew they were good. I knew they were brilliant, you know. I, I've always, I, I, I just think they are the best actors on the planet, you know. Uh, so it was all that, it was all that. You know? and, in the, and just one little uh, side to that was in that creative process, the when you're writing the characters, how much, so when we see it on the screen and it's fully fleshed yeah. and it's in 3D, how, how much of the actors have brought to, you are talking about their brilliance, Yeah. you've written a script, you've defined, yeah. you've fleshed out, how much have they, do they bring to that, to bring it to life? Oh, they bring loads, you know, they, 
They, and Does it, that come in the script readings? And I, I, I hardly do any stage directions, you know. Uh, it, it's funny. <laughs> I just don't do them often, you know. Uh, because I think, I think the stage directions should be there anyway. You know, you should be able to read the script and know how you say that line, you know. There's no other way to say that line, you know. But they do, they do add to that and bring stuff to that, you know. Uh, it, with, uh, with, with the likes of Stephen, for instance, uh, he, I, I know he spoke to a prison officer. Yeah. And after speaking to that prison officer, he came back after a few hours and he wanted to show off well, he'd learned, and he had learned a great deal, you know, yeah, about how you, can, fun, yeah, yeah, yeah. how you conduct yourself as a prison officer, where you stand, you know. So he brought, he brought all that, you know. If, 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 uh, if you're working with good actors, they'll bring you loads of stuff, you know, uh, and, and you pretend it's all yours, you know. But, but, but everything, everything I see on screen, not everything, obviously, but uh, when I write a script, I see it unfolding in my mind's eye. On, you know, everything takes place up here, you know, um, so, so I've, got, I've got that landing on the prison, I've got the noise, I've got the cells going, I've got the cells and, you know, I, I see it all as I'm writing it, you know, yeah. so. You've walked there before and... Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Visually so, and mentally. Yeah, I don't think, well, no, I, that's wrong as well because I've done Mary Queen of Scots and things like that, but I, I'm always happy when I'm writing about things I know. You know, yeah. I'm, 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 I'm always happier then. Because yeah. one of the questions I asked a few people, uh, you know, that we were talking today, and one of the questions that came through, and this is not my question, you know, so in declaring all honesty, but one of the questions which touches on what you've just talked about actually was the characters in time. So not just Sean yeah. and Stephen's character. They've all got a deep backstory. Yeah. You know, these are not just slightly sketched in yeah. uh, characters. I, I presume you must have gone and researched those for the for their stories as well. You know, you've got an alcoholic yeah. teacher, you've yeah. got a prison guard who's compromised, but then yeah. you've coloured in a lot of characters there as well that are in there. Yes, yeah. I think every one of those characters is an aspect of my character, you know. Uh, uh, some, sometimes at my very worst and sometimes at my very best, you know. They're all aspects of my character. Uh, I don't think I particularly researched any of them, you know. Um, I'm not. I'm trying to think. I don't. I don't think I did. I. Th I think I had them up here, you know. The guy who robs a betting shop. I mean, that's me. You know. How many times have I stood in that betting shop? Well, I, at the time, I was a young man. I was gambling mad, lose everything. You know. What do you do now? Do you rob the betting shop? You know. It's. It, it, um, I've been there. You know. I and mean, it's easy to write when you've been there. You know. Yeah. It is, yeah. And the, um, if I can mention to you, Tom, when we spoke earlier, the touching on time and the time it takes, Jimmy with a you know phenomenal back catalogue of credits to his uh, name. The time it didn't just materialise overnight, did it? From the idea, the script, the concept, what? How long does this took to... I think any, any good idea just yeah. materialises. It's worked, isn't it? Mm. It's, it it's, it's rewritten, it's written and it's rewritten again. And, and you, you, you're ruthless with, with good stuff. I mean, really good stuff. Yeah. I mean, we, we, we had whole storylines that, that just aren't there. Whole characters that just aren't there. And, and you never find the perfect version on the first attempt. So, you know, that's... The, it's the pain, but it's also the joy of it, isn't it? And it, you know, it, the pain is losing some of those things, but the joy is finding them in the first place. And I think that 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 was what we you know we experienced. How long does it take? I don't think you can set a time. It's a bit like you know, writers often get asked, "How many words do you write a day?" or "How many pages do you write a day?" I mean, you can set yourself challenges and goals, but you can have days where you write nothing, I imagine, and you can have days where you you know it's just flying. And, and it's, it's the same with, with developing stories. You know, some, sometimes you, you feel that you're on fire and everything is, is just hitting. And other days, and we've had them on, on this, where you know, every idea was a shit idea. Mm. And, yeah. and you know, that, that is you know, a challenge in itself because nobody wants to come away from a meeting thinking we've achieved nothing because mm. 
time is precious and it, you know and it was yeah. but uh, how long did it take us i think we're about are we, are we two and a, you forget as well i think we're two and a half years now mm. from from first discussing it aren't yeah. we and and those were there were broad concept discussions in mm. the early stages mm. and and yeah jimmy says some of those characters are him that you know that you know i've known him for 30 years now mm. and you know i i recognize character that is you know and people that are you know elements of his own life um and i think that's where you can't you can't force a writer to go into a direction you've got to give them the motivation to delve deep and find it um but at the same time keep challenging and keep directing into you know a direct a direction that you think is interesting and is giving story and drama that you know the things that we we we're, we're looking for but at the same time uh giving the freedom and and stepping back to allow the version to come forward which is Jimmy's mm. you know that, that's that's where it's it's a, a very strange relationship at mm. times you don't want to be um manipulating the story to make it not his yeah mm. I presume, therefore, the word that you, although you actually already mentioned it, COVID didn't exist when you were. Didn't? Oh. No, no, it didn't. Yeah. No, oh, at the oh, beginning, oh, at the started, beginning no, no, no. So, no. logistically, yeah. when that, at what point, when the lockdown came, uh, were you <laughs> ready to roll? Yes. Yeah. yeah, we were. Yeah. yeah, we were in prep. Uh, we were in pre prep. We had sorted out the cast, uh, the lead two. Uh, we had sorted out some key HODs and had the team sort of coming together. Um, we had established a couple of the locations. We were that far into it, you know, yeah. and and then it started to raise its head that this was going to be bigger than it, you know. I think the whole country had this realization that this is becoming bigger than we thought it might, and it's becoming something like we've never experienced before and uh, and I th I've said over the years you don't really need a producer until something really goes wrong and and you know that that was the the moment wasn't it you know of going right something is really going wrong um, and that's when you need them the most and it's so it's at that point that you you, know, you have to make some fairly difficult and and you know uh, strong decisions yeah. and, and you you risk losing everything in that moment I mean you know one of the the things that we could have lost is is the money you know the, the commitment to it the other one was the availability of the cast and by that stage we had fallen in love with the cast you know that we <laughs> we could see that, that you know on the page what this was going to be the scripts were pretty much 100% there by that stage mm. actually I don't think there was an awful lot of change mm. um, so we knew what it could be and we couldn't get out of our heads the idea of, of Sean and Stephen in those parts um, and yet that hung by a thread on a on a day-to-day -day basis and I mean, there's definite conversations we had where you know even I was honest enough to admit how perilous it was and, and you know there were many times that I didn't admit how bad it was because that you know that's that's not going to help uh, anybody it's just going to terrify people and, mm. and we don't want that i want everybody to enjoy the experience and give their best yeah. but um no there were there were definitely days where mm. uh, it, it felt like we could have something as special as it is and thankfully everybody has seen how special it is and yet it might never exist apart from on the mm. page and in because yeah. that was one of the things that struck me watching it was if COVID never existed, there's scenes there that you would just take for granted, mm. like uh, people together hugging, you know, mm. those, those touching moments with the, yeah. the dad and the daughter, you know. Mm. Yeah. You, you shot that during yeah. when people couldn't do that. Yeah. Yes. You yeah. know, I know some of them was like there was an, an, an extra layer of resonance about that whole idea of isolation, because all of a sudden the nation, are, we've probably. And that was one why I was asking about time and the timing of time. It's like maybe as a nation, we've never probably been more tuned into the idea of isolation yes. and lack of contact. Yes. So we can empathise a little bit more with 
the prisoners yes. and their families. But logistically, how did you pull that off? Because if you didn't know COVID, you just think that's an everyday scene. Yeah. Uh, again, it, 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 all producing and making the stuff, and Jimmy's a producer as much as yeah, anybody else, as much as Sean and Stephen are, we all understand how to make something. And the desire in making something is to make it feel real. And so if we were doing a, a car stunt in non-COVID times, we don't want people to look at it and go, oh, that was a great stunt. What we want is for them to look at it and go, oh, shit, that car just crashed. Uh, that's the real, that's the authenticity. That's what you're trying to create. So it would have been a total failure on our behalf if anybody watched it felt, oh yeah, they did that, but it was slightly separated because of COVID and it wasn't quite as it normally would be, but we'll forgive them. That, would, that wouldn't have been good enough. And mm. you know, we set ourselves that, that, that mm. challenge at the beginning mm. that we do this, but mm. we only do this if we can make sure that it's as good as it would be regardless of mm. what else is going on in the world. Mm. Did you have that feeling that when you were making it, and as you say, the, the extraordinary, the fact that you were doing things that in everyday life people had stopped doing, was there a, was there a sense that you know, you've got actors hugging and touching and living or being together physically and in their private lives and they, they can't do that. Was mm. It was terrifying. I mean, we had a director that wouldn't stop hugging people. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and it was terrifying on a daily basis that every, in fact, every three days we, we played Russian roulette with 120 people with getting them all tested. And obviously it's the right thing to test them to find out that everybody's healthy and to protect everybody else. But at the same time, as those results came through, and they came through in batches quite often on a Friday evening after, after wrap, so 8, 9 o'clock throughout the evening. And I think the last one we got was about 10.30. What a way to spoil your weekend. Uh, as they came through in batches, it was like, right, we've ticked off that group. We've ticked off that group. Those people aren't uh, yeah, affected and so on. But occasionally, and it did happen, we got a positive ping. And, yeah. and then the turmoil that created, mm. you know, what is now possible? What isn't possible? What can we do for the next three days? How long will this affect us for? Two weeks. How much work can we achieve in that time? When will we stop? And you know, filming is an expensive business. Stopping costs money. Doing nothing costs money and you know we we only had so much to start off with and you know we had big ambitions so we didn't want to compromise it it was, it was terrifying it was horrible wasn't it mm. would you say it's probably been the most complex production oh been, without it? doubt yeah uh, because i think it was a, a complex production in its inception before covid you know it was it was thought provoking and challenging and you know wanting to touch on those human uh, aspects that you know Jimmy's spoken about you know what it is that that you know it is to to be alive and make mistakes to be flawed to to look for redemption and forgiveness um, that is a, a difficult bit of storytelling we had all of that and then some strange you know logistical thing that that you would say well normally logistics only affect logistical operations in this case, everything affected you know, the personal. You know, it did affect how close actors could be uh, or what we did to get them closer. It did affect how a director wanted to stage and block a scene mm. uh, or how many people they could have in the room or how many crew we could have around us uh, to make something smooth and, and, and work properly. And this is, you know, that... You know, the quality of a production isn't down to one or two individuals. It's a team sport. You know, we, you know, we tested 120 people because it takes 120 people to make it. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Do you, given that all that, do you feel that there's, because I know with uh, moving on, yeah. with the anthology, yeah. and given what you've just said, I mean, oh, the, the pandemic is over. Do you feel that you've said enough? Do you feel that you could... Do you think there may be more to say on what you've said in time? There were uh, individual stories more, yes. Um, but prison as an idea, I, th I think that's okay by me to have three parts, I think. 
I, I, all, I will, Tom, Tom will be sick of this. I, I always said it should have been four parts, you know. Uh, and it, it, it I was thought a, you were doing a nod to Chekhov, by yeah. the way, <laughs> doing the three yeah. parts. No, it was a toss-up between three and four parts. If, if it was three parts, it was easier to schedule for the BBC. So me being me, I said three parts, you know. But as soon as I said three parts, I, I felt I'd made a mistake. I, I, I think it should have been four parts. Um, and we might have kept some of the stuff we cut, you know. But um, I think it works. It's, it's a brilliant piece of work, and it's not because of the script. It's a brilliant piece of work because of the cast, the crew, the director, you know, the executive producer, everybody involved. Well, it's brilliant. I mean, the first day after, the, you know, the reaction has been, you know, nothing short of phenomenal. You've had five yeah. star reviews and yeah. The Guardian and, you know, yeah. a lot of yeah. well received people who are saying fantastic. That must fill you with a huge amount. I've just, just been walking along the road to here. And a bus driver stopped his bus, wound the window down, and said, "That was fantastic last night, Jimmy." And I wound it up and drove off. <laughs> job done. Yeah, yeah, and it is job done. I mean, it's nice yeah. to get five-star reviews in the Guardian, but I tell you what, nothing gives you a buzz more than a bus driver saying, "You know, yeah. that was special." Mm. And I think that that you hope that you tell stories that that change attitudes and opinions. Uh, you certainly start off with that aspiration mm. that, that what is the point in telling this story? Well, hopefully it will make somebody feel differently uh, in a better way. Uh, and if, if we've got close to achieving that, even with you know, a very small number of people, then, well, that's, that's where you take your pride. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. 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 there's a, the, the, what I liked in as much as that it's, I mean, people say that it's bleak because of the setting and the... Even though one character with the with the Sean being character there's that that scene at the end of and I don't give anything away so people are watching yeah. in the traditional way as opposed to those who might want to binge watch like I did. Yeah. The the sense of hope. Yes. Yeah. You, you didn't you didn't take that away, you kept that there for Yeah. It's hard to talk about a scene that gives gives the end away, isn't it? Yeah. But that that scene originally was Sean Bean embracing that particular person he speaks to at the end outside the prison, which was me being so uh, so sentimental, and uh, but uh, it was soon knocked out of me that particular scene. But the way it is now, the, the scene as it is now, I think brings the drama to a, a really fitting conclusion. It's a scene of it's a scene of hope of atonement, isn't it? I think we can say that much, can't yeah, we? Yeah, definitely. I, I think yeah. hope was a, an enormously powerful. Uh, marker for us when, when we were trying to develop the story, wasn't it? Yeah. That, you know, what have we got to show at the end of this? It, it is hope. Uh, mm. And I think the, the proof in that scene in particular is that, I can't tell you how many times I've watched it now, I mean, you know, in various stages in, in production and so on, it will be uh, well into the late hundreds. Um, it gets me every time. Uh, and I, it, there's something perfect about the conversation that, that makes me feel what it is to be alive. And, and that, uh, that is a testament to the quality of the writing, the power of the performance, and, and actually a great piece of editing and, and, yeah. and direction as well. And it's beautifully mm. put together. And I, I think that you, you can't detract one element from you know, the, the final piece. It, it is the sum of its parts. Um, but as an initial idea of what were we trying to achieve, I think a lot of it is summed up in that scene. Yeah, yeah. And it's about hope. Yeah, it is about yeah. hope. Yeah. 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 Mm. I felt that, I, you know, because it's a, it's a hard watch and it's intentionally, it's a the hard watch. You know, yes. It's a mature approach to a very difficult subject. And, yes, But yeah. that ending was, yes. I wouldn't say it was uplifting because I don't think, because there's yeah. the other side of the coin of the, Yes, Stephen's character, and yes, you know, and yeah. what that will lead to, which you leave open ended, which I thought was quite a clever little yes touch. Yeah, you know, yeah, the way that that yeah. scene in the van is the scene at the very beginning of episode one. It's yeah, sort of that sliding door. Yeah, mirror. yeah, yeah. If you talk to people in prison, that they'll often talk about that sequence of being taken from the court up to the prison. Yeah, you know, and and the the you know the that noise in, in that van, you know. 
it's it's always stayed with me that I've had conversations with many prisoners over that scene, you know. Yeah. And and they, they I think they all say much the same thing. It's just bedlam, you know. Yeah. Uh, no, I was mm. I was very touched. The um, one mm. of the subjects we talked about just previously about uh, I know you've mentioned it in other media was uh, not trying to fall into this this trap of stereotypes. Um, we talked about class and. You know, the, the whole yeah. idea of how Scousers have been portrayed over time, down the years, through what, you know, yeah. whether it was Brookside or Bread or, yeah. you know, whatever. Yeah. But there's the, the, the flip side of the stereotype is, is the diversity issue. And mm. I'm going to say with the BAFTAs that was on, yeah. you, you've worked with TV you know, for a long yeah. time, do you, know, the, do you still see a lack of diversity? And I'm not just talking gender and race. Yeah. Is it still hard for a northern man, woman, to get a, a piece onto television, mainstream TV? As a writer, you mean? Yeah. Uh, I, no, I don't think it is. Um, it, it's hard to get in that position, to, to find yourself in that position. Because uh, what happened to me was absolutely amazing, you know. Um, I was there at the very start of Brookside, you know. And uh, they were looking for writers, and there weren't a great deal of writers around. Now that now there's half a million, it seems, in the whole of Liverpool, you know. But back then there weren't that many, you know. So I, I was absolutely blessed to be to be in the city at that time, you know. Um, and I've forgotten what got me onto this. What was the question? I was more than yeah. fact that yeah. I was trying to see whether the opportunity. I mean, yeah. you're talking there about a unique opportunity that you had at a moment in time, yes. but the opportunities today. I mean, you know, yeah. currently being filmed by students at the LMA in Liverpool, yeah. um, they're yeah. looking to create a career in the media. Yes. And some of them may actually even be hopeful sc screenwriters or writers themselves. Yes. Yes. Do you yes. get a sense that the yeah. opportunities are good enough today or do you think it's more difficult? Uh, I can't say because I, I, um, I, I don't know is the answer. Um, uh, I do my own thing, you know. Um, there's, um, I see myself as a TV writer, and all the stuff that goes on be behind the camera, you know, uh, I, I know very little about. I've always known very little about it. <coughs> In my experience of, of, of whether there is enough diversity and representation uh, is honestly no, um, but, uh, but but possibly it's easy to be sidetracked on where you look for that diversity. And I think we should always be challenging ourselves to find the, the voice that isn't represented. And, and all too often, I think that boils down to simple things, that, you know, class, uh, class, I don't know, but as an opportunity. You know, class is an odd one for me, but financial opportunity is something that you, you, you talked about before. And, I, I don't think that that is made easy enough for people. I mean, you know, students today uh, trying to enter into the industry, it's difficult to come into a freelance-based industry uh, that requires you to be mobile uh, to any part of the country, to be able to put yourself up, to be able to drive to a location, you know, when possibly you haven't had the opportunity to even learn to drive. Yeah. And I think, you know, those are, those are you know, they, they boil down to simple uh, aspirational expectations that some, some kids don't get given in life. And I think that their experience is no less important to, to bring to a production um, and shouldn't be excluded because their background hasn't enabled them to take a driving test. Um, and that is one of the... the, the cruelest of, of qualifications that people don't have yeah. um, and particularly in our industry it is very difficult to to maintain working in the sort of productions that we we have where we're in different locations every day and we're you know even this set around the city uh, and you know even this we you know you couldn't be in the same place for two days at a time and we didn't do it all in Liverpool either you know, because it isn't always possible to do that, even with the best intentions. So I think as a broader thing across the, the industry, are we, are we offering enough opportunity to the, the people that, that 
perhaps are being deselected from that opportunity before they even realise. Um, I don't think we are doing enough for those type of people. No. I uh, remember yeah. you saying that you did an interview at Mark Lawson many years ago. It was on Front Row. Yeah. And you said when you walked into the BBC, all you heard and saw were middle class Southern. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I, and um, I actually saw loads of black people in the BBC, but they were all in the canteen working. Yeah. And that, 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 that was true then, and it's probably true now as well, you know, to a certain extent. But um, um, when we did uh, Anthony, um, there was a time when I thought, um, all of a sudden, I am woke, you know, because we're telling a black story about a black family, you know, um, with, 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 and I know an awful lot of black faces on the screen, you know, it's got my name on it, you know, I, I am woke at last, you know, I, un I understand. But the crew was white, the, the crew was overwhelmingly white, you know. And um, it, it, it came to me, it, 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 it's, it's, it sort of really got to me when somebody said, um, I am black and I need somebody who can cut black hair. You know, as simple as that. And I'd never even thought of it. I had taken no responsibility for the crew. I had never in my life taken any responsibility for the crew at all. Oh, that's for other people. I just write the scripts. Well, but from now on I do, you know, uh, I, I'll try not to let that happen again. But it will happen, it will happen, because we've got, there are, there are, we've got many black actors now. That, you know, it's, it's great now, you, can, you, you know, absolutely wonderful black actors. But it's the, the, the same position applies with the crew. We do not have uh, loads of black crew at all. Um, we have to have more, yeah. you know. I think that's about creating an environment that welcomes diversity in all its guises, which is, you know, a, it's, it's welcoming difference. And I think, you know, as an industry, you know, uh, we need to do better. But it, it's surprising that we haven't done a, as, as well as we should be doing, given the mindset of the people that work in the industry are, almost without exception, are actually very liberal-minded, yeah. intelligent, thoughtful people. Um, why haven't we achieved more? Why haven't we got better? Um, that's, that's, that's a big question. Yeah. Uh, it could be a cultural thing as well in terms of it, it feels exclusive before you even enter into it. Um, in the same way that culturally um, the NHS and, and medical uh, careers don't feel culturally exclusive. Um, uh, for for you know various reasons, um, ours must you know by definition of the people that are working in it to some extent portray itself as as separate, exclusive, um, non-inviting, and mm -hmm. you know it's our responsibility mm -hmm. to you know as people who have, have have you know got there and can make a difference you know you, mm. you know as you say it's your responsibility now to make sure mm. that that sort of thing doesn't happen i think we all carry a, a little bit of, yeah. of that responsibility and and need to find ways of being more inclusive and open yeah. i suppose you're by definition you're putting a mirror up to the society that you see yes but clearly yeah. you've looked in the mirror yourself as well and seen yeah. back a reflected back what you've seen while you're doing it. Yeah. But to my shame on Anthony, I, um, it, had, it had to be brought to my attention. I hadn't even seen it and it was there. It, it was plain and simple. There were no black crew, you know, well, hardly any black crew. And um, it had to be brought to my attention for me to notice it. I didn't even notice it. You weren't even aware. No, no, no it's extraordinary, really, you know. When you were but, talking... But, but it's... it's, it's um, I, I actually spoke to Russell T. Davis about it, and he had a great idea. He said there ought to be a black trainee in every department on every shoot, you know. And that's going to be awful at first, because there's going to be a black person running round at the behest of white people, you know. But after four or five years, it would be great, because that person would be head of department, you know. And so the, that's the way forward, I think. Um, a a BAME person. As a trainee in every department on every British shoot, you know? yeah. Well, otherwise you don't create the la if you don't create the first rung on a ladder. There's no ladder to begin with, then, is there? No. Yeah. no. Well, you were talking about uh, filming just briefly then about filming in Liverpool and filming. I mean, there was a scene where 
uh, my wife shouted out because she's from Witness and we saw the Runcorn <laughs> Bridge. <laughs> you don't, you know, don't really see the Runcorn Bridge on national TV that often. Yeah. So there's a, but the um, I think time I'm right in thinking of, from the Liverpool Film Office is one of four productions that they've invested in through the LCR Production Fund, and I suppose this touches on uh, addressing some of the diversity issues that we've mentioned. Was uh, how important is regional funding in getting these this type of show made and others that you're. In, the BBC and involved in, in this show, and I can talk about the show, it was essential. Without that funding, we wouldn't have been able to make this production. And for that, you know, we're all enormously grateful for the city having the foresight to, to realise that to create something, you, you sometimes have to support it. Um, now, should that be the case? That's a, that's a bigger question. Uh, and I would love it not to be the case. But as long as that investment is a genuine investment that sees a return for the city uh, and sees a return on that investment, then hopefully that's a win-win. That's a sensible use of, of a, a resource that is developing and creating an industry um, and a specialism within the, the region, the city itself. But at the same time, is, is, is seeing a financial return on that, you know, in broader and you know different ways, you know, from the way that we spend money in hotels or locations or hiring people locally, or facilities, you know, developing businesses that, that can grow and be sustained in in the, the region, as well as ultimately, hopefully, through sales and distribution deals, paying that money back. And that, you know, that is a genuine need and desire. It it shouldn't be a, a false promise. Yeah. There's a commercial yeah, absolutely. We're not we're not a charity, and that you know that there should be understood the difference between support and charity. Uh, it's a complex you know equation, but it's it's important to understand that by supporting uh, an industry and enabling uh, stories to be told and productions to go ahead, um, you create opportunity uh, for others to develop and grow. And, and growth is, is a, a wonderful thing to be able to give uh, a city. Yeah, I know for you, Jimmy, there's, we've talked in the past, you know, things like the new film studios that are being built yeah. by the Littlewood side where your, and your sisters, I think you said, yeah, where uh, yeah. That must give you, this, I know I've, you've said many times yeah. in terms of productions that are based in the city because you know that there's going to be a sort of reciprocal kickback into the industry within yeah. the city as well. That's yeah. sort of quite close for you as well. Yeah, it's, uh, it's extremely close because it's Kensington as well because uh, I first moved to Kensington when I was about 15. So, uh, and Kensington was posh then, you know. Now it's no longer posh, you know. But um, it's it, it would be great to see... Uh, uh, um, all that area booming again, you know. Um, I, I was a bus conductor for a while, and uh, I, I was on a special which co called at uh, Edge Lane about four thirty to pick up all the workers, and there must have been about half a million people on Edge Lane coming out of all those factories that used to be there, all getting on my bus. <laughs> it seemed to me, you know, it was extraordinary to be there at that time. And now, now it's, you know, it's well, it's. On the way back, I think, but it it was uh, it, it was amazing. Yeah, but your industry's got a your industry carries with it high skill. You know, there's a lot of technical uh, elements to the job. So there's a lot of you know the Liverpool's boom, for want of a better word, over the last twenty years has been built around tourism, hospitality, retail, which are traditionally seen as mm. sort of low skilled, which yeah. is unfair because there are you know a yeah. lot. of technically difficult jobs within there as well in the supply yeah. chain yeah but the fact that you're you're from a city that you're creating content yeah. and stories yeah. that may not necessarily be about the city because you leave the area sort of ambiguous but you've yeah. got an idea that it's in the northwest that's right yeah. you almost you know and you've got a family that have grown up in this city yeah so you must there must be a huge amount of as much as seeing your name on television, there must be yeah. a huge amount of pride to know us. You say you've walked down the street and the bus driver's gone. Yeah, yeah. It isn't just about the fact that you, you're, yeah, you're physically, yeah. you're putting something back into the city as well. That must give you yeah. a huge amount of pride. Uh, uh, I suppose I am really. I, I, I am doing that, but 
it, it, it's more of an angle when I see Media City over in Manchester getting all that money spent on it, you know. And they, we're getting a fraction of that, really, you know. Great things are getting done in this city, I know that, you know. But it's a fraction, the spend is a fraction of what's spent over in Media City, you know. Why can't we have Media City as well, you know, as everything else, you know. Yeah. I know that's changing in Edge Lane now. I, th I think things will improve there. With the new studio, I think that's that. the intention. I mean, yeah. Netflix, BBC. You saw, I mean, I've, yeah. I've got a list here of you know Doctor Who, Peter yeah. Blind is the responder. That they've got and yeah. themselves with time. That's just in the last six months yeah. during the pandemic. So the city yeah. must be getting something right. Yeah, you know, I know it's got wonderful architecture, the backdrop. Yeah, but we must have a pool of talent now as well. I would Definitely. assume. From I mean, this this skill yeah. set that you've you've got in the city now goes back to. Yeah, I'll mention her name, Lynn Saunders. She doesn't get mentioned enough, actually, yeah. in my mind, who runs the, the, the film office and the, the fund that we're talking about. And she was back in the early 90s setting up the, the film office that, that was quite a progressive and, and uh, revolutionary idea that, that uh, if you make it easy for people to work in a city, then more people will work in the city. And if you make it easy for people to come here, they will train and develop people who want to stay here and, and be a part of it. And I, I'm definitely a part of that. I was, you know, I was a, a young location manager and assistant director back then. And I, I, was, I was fortunate that there was work coming into the city then that supported me and sustained me and enabled me to you know, gain a skill set that progressed and developed mm -hmm. into a, a wonderful career. And, and I know many people that, you know, mentioned Brookside earlier and, and you know, everything that was done up at Mersey, now Lyme, uh, you know, and LA in, in recent years and so on. There is a thriving industry that is highly skilled, well paid, uh, and, and, you know, uh, giving, giving people the opportunity to do things in the, with their lives and as part of their career that they enjoy and love. And I think, you know, for all the people that worked in the factories, you know, uh, and, and it's a shame that, you know, a lot of that doesn't exist anymore. Um, actually, you know, if you can do a job that you love, uh, and, and I know that everybody that works, you know, on, on our productions genuinely is passionate about what they do, then to some extent that's, that's an even better goal to mm. aim for, that we can give more work to more people, but at the same time the quality of that work in terms of what it gives them in terms of quality of life, not just financial, but, you know, in terms of creative challenge. That, that's, that's something that we should be really aiming for. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. I was, I'm, we'll come to a close in a minute. Um, I just wanted to ask it. I'm conscious of the audience that we've got in the room. Your advice, Jimmy, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. given the fact that, I say, you've put in plenty of hard yards in your... Um, chosen a profession and have excelled to great heights. If you saw young Jimmy walking down the street yeah. on his way to the, uh, yeah. the bet in the shop, what advice would you give to yourself or maybe just, just to genetically to a young kid today who's got aspirations of, yeah. they see things that aren't quite right, they yeah. want to express themselves, what would you, what would you be your little tip? Uh, you I would say, uh, have a go. You know, uh, th th that's, th that's the only way to learn. Um, I don't know. It, it, I'd, I'd it, agree it, with that. It, Never hold it, yourself yeah. back. I mean, you know, the, yeah. you know the, if, if you listen to, you know, the, the dark side of your, of your, of your, your mind, yeah. um, then there'll always be a reason not to do something. Yeah. What you've got yeah. to do is, is, is open up and challenge yourself and be open to, to, yeah. to having a go. Yeah. I, I, at the same time, I was crazy, you know, I, I, was, I was a head case. The, that's the time I first met Tom, was a, um, um, must have been the first series of Cracker, yeah, was, was it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the, what, 1993, uh, 50, uh, I was 43, I was 43, Tom. And, uh, you were an you old think, man, and yet you're older than me now. But you, you, think you, you, you think at 43 you've learned a bit of sense, you know, and I was an absolute idiot. I was a head case, I really was. So I would just say, go, go easy, you know. Just keep your mouth shut, don't drink so much. Keep, you know, uh, keep, keep your mouth shut, your ears wide open, learn, listen, you know, and bit by bit progress, you know. 
But um, some of your characters I, would have been a bit more boring. I mean, you, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. The, the likes of Fitz, Fitz yeah, 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 yeah. It'd yeah, have been very yeah. dull if you. Well, uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, that's what that came out of. Well, but that you've got thing, that method right in there, haven't you? It, it is. It, it, it came out of Hillsbury because um, uh, after Hillsbury, I wanted to say certain things, you know, mainly about the white working class male and the contempt he was held in, mm. you know, because we were. We were thought, everyone thought we were fascists, bigots, you know, sexist pigs, you know, all that stuff. So um, that's where Fitz was born, after Hillsborough, you know, and that's where he belongs. I've, I've since found out you shouldn't go back there now, you know what I mean? He belonged in, in, in that period at that time for about nine or ten years maybe, yeah. and that was it, you know. Um, so, but I don't know, if an opportunity comes along, Go for it, seize it, work hard. Oh, that, that, that's what I would say. I, I always worked harder than anybody mm. else. Mm. I really I did, you know. I, yeah. I never stopped working, never Don't stopped Don't expect it to happen. Yeah. You, you've I, got to I put never, the effort yeah. in. Did you yeah. ever pick up a How to Write book? Or? No, I have read them, but uh, no, I've, I haven't read them for guidance or anything like that. No. It's, uh, I once got a, like a, a script that was about 400 pages long, and the guy had marked all the uh, uh, um, all the moments at which these things he'd been advised to have happened happened in his script. It was about four hundred pages long. There was so much in it, you know. It was absolutely crazy. I think. Um, I think if, if you're any good, you'll, you'll if you're any good, you'll know. If you're any good, you'll know what's good, you know. Uh, but, and if you're any good, you'll know what's bad, you know. The, the best piece of advice I ever learned was. Um, uh, the art of good screenwriting is the avoidance of bad. You know, if you can avoid bad screenwriting, there's a fair chance you'll write some good stuff in there, you know. Just avoid the bad. And that, that, that means, that, that means, that sounds easy, but it means cutting loads of stuff, doesn't it? You it's know, the editing, look, 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 yeah. you don't write yeah. the first script as the best no. script. Yeah. yeah, edit, yeah, edit as you, you go along and edit again. Yourself. Yeah. Pardon? Are you brutally honest with yourself. Oh yes, yeah, yeah. And, and have yeah. people around you that are brutally honest yes. with you as well. Yeah. And I think that's yeah. that's difficult, you know, to, trusting, you know, particularly from a personal exploration into, you know, a lot of those stories and characters are, to some extent, you know, versions of yourself. To then trust somebody when they say that isn't quite right, mm. and that's that's really difficult. But I suppose yeah. we. The, the resonance that what you've produced wouldn't have that resonance if there wasn't truth. Because yeah. really that's what you're boiling it all down to, is yeah. these, these people, these events, these circumstances, this, yes. is, this is a truth. It might be a universal truth, or it might be a specific truth to that individual. And if it's not there, then you haven't really got the drama to begin with, have you? Cause it's spot on. And people and, uh, wouldn't believe yeah. it. No, yeah, yeah, absolutely spot on. And <clears throat> I think that's where we first came in. Because it's the casting of Sean Bean and Stephen Graham and all the other members of the cast. They are ab absolutely perfect, you know. And uh, uh, when you see those people acting, you believe that what they are doing, they are actually doing. And anything that gets in the way of that has to go. You know, if there is anything that gets in the way, it's got to go, yeah. hasn't it? Including the writing, you know, the, the fancy writing, the fancy dialogue, you know, the, the jokes. and or, got to go. It, it gets in the way of convincing the viewer that what they are seeing is actually happening. Can yeah. I just ask then, because we're going to um, highlight from making the show, <laughs> what was your personal highlight on Alan Alice, Jimmy, what was yeah. his? I, I, without creeping and because he's here, working with him again, I absolutely <laughs> loved it. And it, uh, it, you know, it's, it, you know, we've worked, you know, over the years on other things, but just to feel that we came together and being able to work in the capacity that I am now working in, you know, as, as the exec on it. That was a, a, a privilege and a joy. Yeah. And mm. you, Jimmy? I only went you to the set. Feel free to yeah. say it was working with no, Tom. No, 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 working with Tom, of course. <laughs> uh, I went to the set once in the whole, because of COVID mainly, you know, I only went to the set once, you know. Uh, I think it was, uh, it was discovering that Sean Bean and Stephen Graham we're still going to do it because we, we were all set to do it and I thought these guys will go to America you know because they, they get offers galore you know we're going <clears throat> we are bound to lose these two people to America uh, but then after a good while I found out they were they still wanted to do us mm. 
<clears throat> and uh, I found that very moving. You know, I, I was I was overjoyed. Yeah. Good. So, um, Tom, obviously, time in the traditional uh, way of TV was on last night, and viewers will get to watch the next episode next Sunday. But actually, with iPlayer, that's rendered. You don't need to do that anymore. The challenges that that presents in terms of from creating a talking point. So, whereas time, when we were younger, would have had a, a shelf life of Sunday into Sunday and that centre climax, and now I play it, you can watch it in a day if you want, or you know. Yeah. To some extent, there's there's uh, more competition than there was. I mean, you go back you know, uh, to the eighties, there was four channels, uh, and so therefore, you know, it was easier to stand out. But then in other respects, we can promote and we can you know, get on social media and we can, you know, we can have you know, conversations like this put out into various uh, platforms and so on and never have dreamt of. And so I think the life of a project can, can last a lot longer because it's accessible on, on time and uh, on, on iPlayer in, in time's case. Uh, and so that, that it's, it's a new opportunity. It's not necessarily a challenge that's a negative thing. It's a positive that, you know, all too often we've made good things and because it's gone out, apart from those people that videoed it, you know, and then the DVD comes out and that's a bit of a specialist market. For us now, we, you know, hopefully the word of mouth will spread and, and more and more people will watch it over a longer period than just last night. Um, so I, I think, you know, the future of a non-linear uh, platform system of watching and accessing content is is only a good thing for program makers like us. Apart from the money, because <laughs> uh, as a writer, you pray for a repeat. Yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. As a producer, yeah. you don't get any repeat. Please. Yeah, so as a writer, you do. You see, so. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and you, you. I mean, in this format, obviously Netflix of. HBO, that American model of, you know, continue. Have you got a particular favourite? None. Well, you haven't been involved in, but you've thought that was you know, something maybe in the last 12 months or six months where you thought that was fantastic TV drama. I'm hooked on Mayor of East Town at the moment. I think it's, it's just beautifully told. Uh, I'm, I'm enjoying that. I think that for me, there are, there are programmes that, that slide from should watch, so I'm up to speed. And then, actually, I'm going to carry on watching it because I'm enjoying it. And, uh, and those, those occasions, you know, are you know, slightly special, actually, because watch, I don't know how you feel, but you know, watching drama is, is, to some extent, it's work. You know, so if, I, if I'm, you know, in my evening, if I'm watching something for fun, then it, it must be good. Yeah. And yourself, Jimmy, are you, do you ever look up for, like, a writer that you think, oh, yeah, that's... They know what they're doing. They're yeah, I do. And uh, every time I turn them on, I want it to be disastrous. <laughs> you know? And uh, be because they're good, it, it isn't. You know, uh, I do like Russell T. Davis. I really, I really, you know, I think he's good. Uh, Sally Wainwright is, is good. You know, so there's quite a few. Because you, collab like you collaborate as well a lot, don't you, with other writers? I do, yeah. I, I love that aspect of my job. You know, it's, it's, great, to, it, it's, it's great to have a, a person who, you know, the first thing they've ever written, the, you're working on the first thing they've ever written, and you know, you know that this will make a difference to their life, you know. But it, you also know it could be a cracking piece of drama as well, you know, so mm -hmm. it's great. You can do that. Like, I remember seeing a play... Yeah. Um, yeah. It was about gun crime, and it got turned into. I think it was one of the episodes. Yeah, I'm uh, trying to remember. Uh, uh, Joe Molly's tale, is it? Um, yeah. Yes. And it's about the mother in the hairdresser. Yes. And then Carol Cullington. Is, Carol. Yeah. It was a play. Yeah. Yeah. Took uh, that in. Uh, a piece of great television. Uh, I actually watched it in Walton Prison. It was performed in Walton Prison as well. Awesome. Yeah. 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 Uh, I watched it there. Uh, that that starred uh, Olivia Coleman and uh, Anne Marie Duff, and it was a really spectacular piece of work. I think uh, was it accused or 
the street, I think it was the street, wasn't I it? I think it might have been accused. Actually. And accused, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. But it, 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 it was a good one. Yeah. It was one of those good ones. We, we tended to, we, we aimed high with the street and accused and occasionally, occasionally we nearly got there, you know what I mean? But, and I think that's a case of us nearly getting there, you know? Not quite, of course. You never do get there, yeah. but we, we nearly got there. Perfection yeah. is a, the, the endless pursuit, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Actually, but before I get to the final, final question, what you've just said then about, will t do you know whether time will be shown in prison? Have you spoken to the prison service about doing special shows? They have access to television, so they'll have been able to watch it. Yeah. So, and they can catch up, mm -hmm. so, yeah. And you'll eventually somehow get feedback, somehow. To well, I actually know a guy who's doing life so <laughs> I'll, get, I'll get plenty of feedback from him. You know, he's been a, he's been a boon to me. Yeah. 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 Oh, you, so if you add in as much as it, when you've been writing and had, had to occupy yeah. the characters in your head, yeah. you've been mindful of the audience, the, the specific audience of prisoners as well. Yeah, you? oh yeah, yeah. And, and, and no, I know we'll get criticised, you know, but um, I, 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 I think it's accurate. I, I really do, you know. I really do think it's accurate. Yeah. Well, um, the final question, I'll try and end on a light note, because I know yeah. with what the, some of the topics we've discussed today are pretty, um, have what we call as heavy. Desert Island Discs. This is a <laughs> Desert Island Discs, Jimmy. Yeah. But um, I know in Desert Island, one of the formats is, is that you're on the shore and the waves are lapping and they, they wash away your records. But in this instance, these aren't your records that you've chosen. These are your your works. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if your works were in bound book form that we've talked about before, yeah. And you saw the waves coming up, and you know you've had Brookside Cracker, the Dockers, the Lakes, the Streets, Sunday, Hillsborough Common, moving on, Accused, Broken Care, Anthony. You've done King Cotton for stage, Priest for film, many, 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 many others. Yeah. The waves are coming in. What would you want to save? Um, I used to have a safe in the house and um, we got the floor done so it was bricked up and in that safe I left a copy of Hillsborough, you know, so um, it would be Hillsborough. And I, because it's not Desert Island Discs, I have the luxury yeah. of bending the rules, yeah. I sort of guessed that you might have said that to be yeah. honest. Because no, not because it's good, it's one of the worst scripts I've ever written but for all kinds of legal problems, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and the consequences of yeah. that piece yeah. of drama. Uh, we'll give you another choice then. We'll uh, give, you right. a give you the second one. Um, well, I, I like to think, we were talking before, there's, 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 uh, there's bound to come a time when uh, I can't do w what I'm doing now, you know, and uh, I'm hoping I know when that time is. But I think I've been getting better. So, and I, I think. I think for that reason, I would pick the last thing I wrote, which would be Time. Because uh, I think that's a better piece of work than I did prior to Time. And I like to think that the next piece of work I do will be better than Time. You know, so, yeah, I'd have to say Time, probably. There are loads of things I, I would choose, you know. But if you're talking about, you know, the standard of the script, uh, it, it would be Time, yeah. Cool. I know it's a cruel question because you've got a body of work that's yeah. you know, so impressive. It's not an easy answer. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, it's always nice. To be <laughs> it's always nice to think about it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, listen. Thanks very much, both. Yeah. Uh, you know, busy man. Uh, yeah. Appreciate the time that you've given us today, and good luck with the next project. Both. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.